you're a typical Jewish woman, and I, maybe it's true. <laughs> I've got curly hair, opinions on every subject, and I do not go backpacking. <laughs> Plus, even after years of speech classes, I still have an identifiable bronxiness in my voice. When I walk into a room, some fool always greets me with, uh, welcome, darling, have a seat, enjoy. The last person who did that was a Chinese friend <clears throat> who ought to be more sensitive. I mean, what would she think if I went, oh, thank you, how are you, how are your family? <laughs> this Jewiness has often been an obstacle in my professional life. My agent submits me for a movie, but the director, Harold Slomansky, won't see me because he thinks I'm too Jewish. Um, I hear that all the time, but this is for the part of a rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> Slomansky is only seeing Gentile actresses because, as he puts it, he wants to make sure that the character is likable. <laughs> A while back, I read for commercial, which I knew I would book because I had worked with a director, Stu Lefkowitz, before, and he had been asking for an Annie Corzin type. Well, guess what? I did not get the job. <laughs> Stu Lefkowitz hired a perky little blonde. I am too Jewish to play myself. So I guess I am a living stereotype. And the worst thing about it is having to suffer through the never-ending barrage about, of jokes about me and my kind, jokes about ugly, abrasive, obnoxious Jewish women told by ob ugly, ob obnoxious, abrasive Jewish men. Uh, these guys dream of a blonde goddess who will make them appear less ethnic. It doesn't work. It's like the old joke about Jaime Greenblatt, who changes his name to Standish Merriweather III in order to get into the country club. But on the application, when he's filling it out and it asks his religion, he fills in Goy. <laughs> <laughs> so I decide to write a book defending Jewish women because I see them, or us, as lively, earthy, and nurturing. I'm going to call the book Yenta. And I write to the Oprah Winfrey Show and suggest that they do a program about ethnic men who reject their own women. They like the idea, and I am invited as an expert witness, and I go into all kinds of I'm going to be rich and famous fantasies. Now, let me explain why this is the scheme of a brain-damaged person. <laughs> I don't have a book. I don't have a publisher. All I have is an idea for a book that hasn't been written yet. And I never did get around to writing it. Instead, I turned it into a show. I am the only person in the history of the world who went on Oprah with nothing to sell. <laughs> All I had was a complaint. <laughs> and much as I love to vent, that don't put money in the bank. And it gets worse. Oprah flies me to Chicago first class. Big mistake. You see, I have this problem with food. If someone else is paying for it and I can have whatever I want, I just lose all control. It's like, it's like there's this tape in my brain that keeps playing over and over from my childhood. Finish your plate, little children in Europe are starving. My friend Sandra's mother used to say, eat whatever you want and the rest put in your mouth. <laughs> So what chance did I have? So I'm on the plane, first class, having my second mimosa, and the stewardess says, hi there, for your hors d'oeuvre, would you care for, um, uh, excuse me a moment, would you care for smoked salmon, artichoke dip, or pate? And I say yes to all three. <clears throat> I follow that with a stuffed Cornish game hen and a hot fudge sundae. 
I wobble off the plane, and a limo whisks me to my luxurious hotel just in time for dinner. Oprah Winfrey is trying to kill me. I don't feel so good. And all my body really wants is a nice cup of chamomile tea, but I tell my body to mind its own business, and I order a five-course dinner with wine and beef stroganoff. I don't usually even eat red meat, but it's the most expensive thing on the menu. Oh, my body is very angry with me. I just hope those little children in Europe are happy. I am seriously unwell. I can't sleep. I'm up all night. What am I going to say on the show tomorrow? How can I convince people that Jewish women deserve some respect? At 5.30, I get a wake-up call, and I am sicker than ever. But breakfast arrives. <laughs> and I force down eggs benedict and a stack of buttermilk pancakes. <laughs> What choice did I have? It was paid for. At 6.30, the limo arrives to take me, green and nauseous, to the studio. It's showtime. I'm ushered into the green room, how appropriate, with some of the other guests. Hi, I'm Annie Corzin. How do you do? My name is Dr. Judith Cohen. Really? Her mother named her doctor. <laughs> There's also a Hasidic rabbi. Hello, rabbi. I'm... Excuse me, but the only woman I'm allowed to touch is a mother of my 24 children. <laughs> Who wants to touch him? <laughs> we go into the studio. The first speaker is a single Jewish professional man who spouts the usual garbage. I never date Jewish women. They look alike, they think alike. The only thing they're interested in is the size of your wallet. Now it's my turn to reply. And I want to bury this asswipe with my cutting wit and irresistible charm. But by now, there are clumps of stroganoff in Benedict sauce floating around in my esophagus. And I am about to represent Jewish women by vomiting in front of 22 million people. I am so sick that my charming and witty response is, same to you and double, and then I gag. The next day at home, Benny makes a lame attempt to console me. Don't make such a big deal about this. Who watches Oprah anyway? <laughs> then I hear my son talking on the phone. No way, that wasn't my mother. Well, not my real mother. Duh, I never told you I'm adopted. So, I fail. Oh, wait a minute. So. <laughs> You know that expression, there's no such thing as a free lunch? I guess it's true. <laughs> so I failed big time on Oprah, but I am still determined that from now on, I will have the courage to be unapologetic about who I am. My first challenge comes soon enough. I'm auditioning for a nice role in a movie. I'm sitting and schmoozing with the director, Phil Kaplan. I tell him that I'm working on a show about Jewish women. Jewish women? Oh, Annie, that you'll really appreciate this joke. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I can't wait. A guy has a heart attack. His doctor tells him to avoid any stimulation. So he marries a Jewish woman. <laughs> So I have a moral dilemma here. How should I handle it? Should I let it slide? Should I say something? OK, here's what I did. <laughs> That's very funny, Phil. And I have a joke for you. <laughs> this little Jewish guy goes in for a sperm count. The nurse gives him a glass container, some magazines, puts him in a little room. 10 minutes later, she knocks on the door. I need more time. Half hour later, she knocks on the door. I need more time. 
Another half hour goes by and finally he says, nurse, I give up. You're going to have to help me with this. I tried with my left hand for 35 minutes. I tried with my right hand for 35 minutes. And I still can't get the lid off the <laughs> container. <laughs> Big surprise, I do not get the job. <laughs> but that night, I sleep like a baby. Years passed. And a little while ago, I did manage to get a book published, a humorous volume about thrifty living. Now, finally, I had something I could sell on Oprah. I could be a bestseller. I could make millions. I wrote to my contact on the show, only to learn that she had been fired the week before the book was published. And I was never able to get through to the new producer. Well, that's showbiz. Timing is everything. <laughs>